Good evening, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a, another very special guest, Judy Carroll. Uh, she's had ongoing contact with the Greys, or Zetas, as some people call them. Um, her first book uh, was, her first two books are The Zeta Message and Human by Day, Zeta by Night. Her third book is Extraterrestrial Presence on Earth, Lessons in History, and uh, she also has uh, she has two e-books, an interview with an alien, comments by an undercover ET, and cosmic spirituality, blending religion and spirit and science in oneness from an off-planet perspective. And she has a YouTube channel called Judy, uh, Judy Carroll, the the Zeta Messenger, and uh, a new podcast on the channel Just Love with the co-host Paula Zane. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, uh, Judy Carroll. Thanks very much, Mike. It's nice to be here. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Well, uh, if I can get this introduction properly, <laughs> we'll have it all down. <laughs> so sure, we'll be fine. How is everything going down in Australia? Not too bad. Um, we're, we're in winter at the moment, which is a bit of a relief for us because um, I'm in Queensland in the subtropics where it gets very, very hot. So we're enjoying some winter weather at the moment. But just to compare, um, I know you folks think in Fahrenheit over there. So uh, we're, we're in uh, centigrade. We're about 10 C today. So I think that's about six, uh, 64 Fahrenheit. I'm not exactly sure. But it's certainly a cool morning, but not as cold. As it would be Four degrees there. is is not a, not, uh, not hot, and it's not cold. It's like um, I guess that's below seventy. So seventy. Yeah. Seven. Anything below seventy starts getting cool. Yes. 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 Well, night, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've got a doona on the bed at night, and it's quite cool. I've got the air conditioning on the hot cycles. <laughs> well, the, yes. down in Texas, uh, which is where I'm from, I'm not there now. Right now I'm living in Georgia. But in Texas, it's getting up to 122, 123 Fahrenheit. Oh, that's hot. Uh, they're breaking records. And, wow. wow. Um, a lot of the United States is breaking heat records right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I think the same thing happened here last summer. It was extremely hot in parts. Um, when, uh, what age were you the very first time you had any odd thing happen to you of any kind? Okay, I was very young. Um, I can't remember exactly because, I mean, I wasn't keeping records back then, but I probably would have been about three years old. And my very first memory is of being taken up Ash Street by a tall, thin, grandmother-like figure, <clears throat> in actual fact, I thought she was my real-life grandmother, and she was holding my hand, and I was taken to board a train, and I realised some years later that this was a screen memory to cover up um, when I was taken on the ET ship, but um, there was no fear involved at all for me on that occasion, and I kept asking my real-life grandmother to please take me on the train again. And, of course, she had no idea what I was talking about. Um, and our street was actually a dead-end street, so there was no train station there. And it took me quite a long time to sort of figure out. It was like I had two brains in my head. And one was telling me, yes, you went up the street to board a train, and the other brain was telling me, but there is no station there. It's a little quiet dead-end street. So that was my first um, experience that I remember. Um, I also vaguely remember an experience with an owl appearing on our roof at night, and my parents hearing it, going outside to investigate because they could hear this strange sound. And when they told me about it in the morning, I remember feeling absolutely terrified because apart from that one experience that I could consciously recall being taken up the street, I had a huge fear during my childhood of someone or something coming into the house to take me. And I realise now that I was being taken up by the ETs and I chose through my free will to experience the fear side of it. 
so that now when I'm speaking to people who are having fear to do with contact with ETs, I can understand where they're coming from because I went through it myself. So how old were, how old were you again when uh, you went on the train? I would have been about three years old, I think. Wow. Okay. So how much of that experience do you remember today? Is it? Uh, do you just remember having an experience or do you remember being actually on the train or on the on what you thought was a train? No, I, I don't actually remember being there, but I came back with the, how can I say, a sort of a subconscious memory of it being a nice experience. I wasn't scared about it. But at the same time, I was obviously being taken regularly because I had this ongoing terror of someone coming into the house and taking me. I also had the classic fear that a lot of people who are having contact with the greys have. I was terrified of dolls and puppets. I had a thing about eyes. Um, my mother had a, actually black out a picture of a storybook of a puppet and another one of a cat hiding in a bush with just its eyes showing. So I had all those classic fears as a child of obviously um, contact that I was having, but I couldn't consciously remember it. Um, I didn't actually have a fully conscious experience until I was age 30. So uh, you went, you're saying you had a gap from the yeah. age of four to the age of 30. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I did have um, an experience at about age 15, which involved missing time and the body paralysis. I woke up in the middle of the night in that state, um, what they call a body asleep, mind awake. And I could see the doorknob of the room turning and I was struggling to move and to call out to my parents. Of course, you can't when you're in that state. <clears throat> so I was really, really scared. But the next thing I just blanked out. And I woke up the next morning with a memory of seeing the door handle turning. Um, and it was after that that I started to become aware that I had other beings coming into my life. I was aware of a teacher who was working with me or an elder. And I knew that he wasn't human. But back then in Australia, there was just no um, idea of ET contact or anything like that. Um, remember, we had no Roswell event or anything. So back then, it just wasn't a known thing here in Australia. Um, so I associated this teacher with the nature spirit kingdom, which I was felt very close with. And from then on, I was aware of having contact with him and the fact that he was sort of pulling strings in the background, helping me with various things. And one of the things that he pushed me into doing was learning Spanish dancing. Now, I have a great grandmother who was a flamenco dancer um, in the gypsy tradition, and she was also a psychic medium. And so when I started suddenly showing an interest in this at age 15, ne never having been the slightest bit interested in learning ballet or anything up until then, um, my parents put it down to, oh, it must have come down through the family line. Um, so amazing strings were sort of pulled, and a number of coincidences happened that enabled me to take up classes in this Spanish dancing, and I ended up as a professional dancer. And years later, it was explained to me by the Greys, when I did get fully conscious contact with them, that they wanted me to, um, A, get used to getting up in front of an audience and performing, because they said one day your work will involve that, which it does now doing interviews. They also wanted me to, um, learn how to use a human body, which the dance classes gave me a lot of help with, and also to express human emotion, which Flamenco, of course, helped me with. So um, it was like preparation for the sort of work that I'm doing now to work as a bridge between them and humans of Earth. So, um, OK, so you had um contact that you thought was a train at the age of three, but you don't remember it. Then you had, at the age of 15, you either, you were awake or asleep? The, in, in that half state. A lot of people okay. who have contact with ETs talk about it. It's like, they call it body paralysis, but that's what uh, it is. Well, okay, so I'm familiar with 
um, when you do self hypnosis, you start by relaxing the body, and then you can continue relaxing the mind after the body, and then but you can put the body to sleep, and you'll start the mind's still awake. You'll start snoring, but it's not quite the same as being paralyzed. Uh, with the night terrors, what, whatever they call it, when your yeah. body is uh, paralyzed and your yeah. mind is awake. That's quite a different thing. Yes. But it yes. sounds yeah. similar. So yeah. Yeah. It, you have you explored uh, through regression either, either of those H3 or H15 events? No, no, I haven't bothered um, exploring with regression um, because I now have conscious awareness of being with the grey, so I, I basically know what it was about. Um, the the um, event at age 15, what that body paralysis is, it's when the spirit, which is a driver of the body, like a driver of the car, the spirit steps out of the body. And we can either do this consciously ourselves or the ETs can help us with. And I know back then my teacher helped me with it. And he would have started explaining to me who and who I am and why I'm here, etc. And they started giving me suggestions and instructions on what I had to do to start preparing for the work that I'm doing now, to work as a bridge between the two cultures. And that preparation involved the dancing back then. So you had a, um, a train, ex what you thought was a train experience at three, which you haven't explored because you don't feel the need. You had another uh, door knob, uh, night terror, body frozen experience at 15. And then after that second experience, what was your third? Uh, okay, okay. Well, after that one, they, they still wanted me to remain unconscious of what but the ET contact. They wanted me to get on with my human life down here. So I worked as a dancer and performed um, for quite a few years. And at age 30, I was still performing. My husband was playing guitar for me. I was married. We were living out on an acreage property. And at age 30, um, one afternoon, I started feeling like I was coming down with the flu, not feeling well. So I went upstairs to lie down, you know, quiet bedroom at the back of the house and the next thing again the body paralysis but this time I was more consciously aware of what was going on and there was a loud roaring sound going on in my head causing a headache and the next thing I became aware of was three greys standing in the room um, they were so physically solid they were blocking out the light from the window on my left hand side one of them I immediately recognised as this teacher who'd been working with me for years. Um, so I wasn't scared. And I immediately recognised them as family. It was like a, a light was turned on. I knew who they were. Um, and they helped me to get up out of my body. And I can remember um, the experience of standing there. When you're out of your body, you're not limited by 3D. I was standing talking to them or sitting on the bed or something, I can't quite remember now, but I was talking to them and I was aware of things behind me as well as them in front of me. And we had a really long conversation. Um, they joked with me and they said, it's, it's time for you to stop hiding yourself away out here. You've got to move back to the city because there's work you need to get on with. And they advised me to take up Tai Chi. They said I needed to learn to meditate. But being a dancer, I was very physically oriented. So their advice was to learn Tai Chi, which is moving meditation. Now, again, back there, in, back then in Australia, we had no, we weren't into these things. My family weren't into New Age stuff at all. I had no idea. I didn't even know what Tai Chi was. And they explained to me that it's like moving yoga. I, di I didn't know what yoga was. So they told me, okay, we want you to, learn Tai Chi to help you to meditate, and we want you to take up some sort of natural healing technique as well. And you need to learn all about energy because that's what you need to pass on, knowledge of energy. You need to pass this on to those humans, and you'll be teaching this, this stuff once you've studied it yourself. Anyway, I had no idea about all this stuff, so it was like, how am I going to be teaching it? I don't even know what you're talking about. 
And it was like, trust us, it's, it's okay, it'll all work out. You'll be moving back to town so that you can study this. Anyway, sure enough, over the next three years, changes happened in our life. The lives had caused us to move back to the city. Um, about a week after we got back to town and settled into a, a house, I noticed a, a, a noticing up in a shop in the shopping centre up the road about Tai Chi classes that were starting in our area. So I rang up and got a place in the class. And the next thing that happened, there was a rental property next door to us and new people came in who had just moved up from down south. And it turned out the woman had been meditating for 10 years. So she was an experienced meditator and her teacher, her meditation teacher, had also just moved up here and she was going to start classes. Now, here's me, never meditated in my life, and I was invited to join a closed meditation circle. So I took the opportunity. And so over the next couple of years, I was training in Tai Chi, training in meditation, and the meditation group that I took part in was like a psychic development circle. And so I was given cha uh, channeling training, but also automatic writing. And from the automatic writing, these beautiful messages started coming through. And again, I knew it was from the ETs. And I, I put a book together up on my website um, with their messages. And so it sort of all took off from there. Um, I was eventually asked by my Tai Chi teacher to start teaching. So I had to go through a lot of training there. I had to study Chinese massage therapy um, to learn about the energy system. Um, did a little bit of acupressure training. And so I now teach Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, and of course, I write books, which came from the automatic writing training that I was giving. So you're, um, how many, you've got three books, so how many of them are channeled? Oh, basically all of them. All of basically them. All of them, yeah. Okay, and the third experience, what age was, were you, when you had the third experience? I was 30. 30. 30. Okay. So you had one at three, one at 15, and one at 30. And um, you said they pulled you out of your body on the third experience. Yes? Yes. Yes. And yes. do you remember being pulled out of your body, the actual? Oh, pull? yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. And, and I realized that that roaring sound, it's a sound that you, that comes through when you move out of the physical body. You can hear the sound of like astral or whatever it is. And that's what the sound was in my ears. And also um, more of my ET consciousness was actually placed in my body. I was aware of something coming in through my crown chakra. And I got a massive download of information at that, um, in that, during that opportunity. So. Can you describe being pulled out of your body? What it feels like? You know, what 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 was the very first? You know, can you go through the experience as if you were going through it now? Did yeah, it yeah, yes. I, I was lying on the bed, became aware of this loud roaring in my ears and the fact that I couldn't move, and I was getting a headache. My head felt like it was going to explode, and I, I sort of lay there, starting to panic and trying to just calm myself. And then the next thing, I was aware of the graves beside the bed, and I just basically sat up out of my body. Um, I can remember sitting on the side of the bed and the three of them standing in front of me and all of us having a discussion. Well, when you got, when the very moment you got out of your body, did you look down and see your body or you look at where you... Un, you know, kind of unaware of your body look, and you were looking at them only? Is that which one? Uh, yeah, I was looking at the trio at that point. I, I have since then looked down at my body when I've left it, but at that point I was still, you know, I wasn't really aware of what was going on, but I was in such a, a state of, oh, wow, they're family, they're family. It's okay, I don't need to be scared. And I was really excited linking with them again. It was a real family reunion. It was absolutely amazing. So uh, the three beings, did you... did? Do they have individual names, these three, the three individuals? Well, this is really difficult because in that state, we don't actually have names per se like we do down here. I recognize them by their energy signatures. That's so, as close as I can say to a name. So you recognize them individually, but 
you still to this day don't have an individual name for each of them. No. And that we, we, that's how we are up there. We know each other by our energy signatures. So in the collective, nobody has a name. It's just a, a, an energetic recognition. It's an energy, yes. Okay. So... Uh, we will sometimes take names when we're working down here because people down here like to label things. They like a name, so we will use a name down here. But when we're up there, not so much. Okay, so... Uh, you're 30 years old, you get pulled out of your body, and how long did that experience last, the, 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 um, the, that moment? Look, I think it lasted about an hour. <clears throat> it was hard to tell because it was missing time. It seemed longer, but when I came back into my body and went downstairs, about an hour had passed. And what did you do in that hour? Can you Can you go through... The whole hour, moment by moment, do you remember all of not, it? Not, not really, not really. They, they just they gave me a download, a huge download of information and reminded me of the fact that I'm a, a, what I like to call a blended soul or a dual soul, as Ju, Ju, uh, Susie Hansen talks about. I was reminded of that. I was also reminded that my job down here is to teach people about energy, so I had to learn about it myself. Um, I think that they did outline to me what would happen, you know, what was going to happen over the next few years, but I couldn't remember that when I woke up. It just sort of unfolded. Um, the, the problem is, is down here we're working with a human brain, which can only process about 10% of our potential conscious awareness. When you're in that other state, your conscious awareness is awoken to much more, um, how can I say, data. And so when you come back into the human body, it's very hard to bring everything back. But I was vaguely aware of what we've been talking about. We've had a long discussion and they explained to me what I had to learn, why I had to learn it, why I was here, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the three, the, you said it lasted one hour or three hours? <clears throat> one hour. One hour, okay. And, and they were talking to you telepathically, correct? Yeah. And they explained that you're going to need to learn energy, and you know, the, the, did they mention they mentioned Tai Chi and Qigong and all that stuff? Yes, they did. Yes, yes, they specifically said Tai Chi because I didn't know what it was. So I said, "What's what's that?" And they said, "It's like moving yoga." Right. Well, I knew a fellow a long, very long time ago who taught. Um, he tried to meld Tai Chi and Qigong together. And so you have, it was kind of odd, you have you have the movement of, of Tai Chi just for a moment, then you stop uh -huh. moving, like with Qigong, you're not, you're not moving, you're doing a static uh, energy movement without moving, yeah. you know, static energy. Um, like a form. Yeah, uh, you know, holding something or, you yeah. know, yeah. hands down or hands in a uh, circle or whatever. You know, you stop for a moment and then you move and then you stop. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of a really odd thing. I, I understood Tai Chi and I understood Qigong, but uh, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around melding the two into one form. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't. I teach them separately. I teach Tai Chi form, long form, Yang style, and I also teach about three types of Qigong. The ones I teach are called Shibashi, but I do, do a pure Qigong one as well, but they're very, very similar. Tai, tai Chi is more uh, related to self-defense. So when I was training to be a Tai Chi instructor, I had to learn three applications for each move. I also learned weapons forms. I do a sword form and a, a fan form. Qi Gong is more to do with breath and stretching. But they're so closely related. Tai Chi actually comes under the Qi Gong umbrella. So my understanding of Tai Chi is that you're supposed to um, I've never gone that far through it, learning it, but my understanding and from a vague perspective is that you learn it until it um, it sort of does itself where you're not thinking of, you're no longer you're no longer thinking about it. You get to a point where your mind is not thinking on the movement that it happens without thought. Is that? Not really, no. It's, it's, it is a type of meditation. It's movie meditation. So what you're concentrating on 
is bringing the energy into your hands and what each move means. See, each move in the particular form that I teach, it's a very, very ancient form, and it's basically, people joke, it's called, it's like Kung Fu on Valium. <laughs> so they're all self-defense moves. So while you're doing it, you've got to keep your mind focused on what you're actually doing with the move. Um, a lot of people get confused with meditation. I think meditation is about blanking the mind. It's not, it's about focusing the mind. So whether you're focusing the mind on a candle flame or on a mantra or um, on a, a move, what you're doing with the Tai Chi, that's all meditation. So you, you're not, uh, you're not so much. So when you describe what you just described, you're describing the moving meditation, but in general, you're saying that meditation is not about blanking in the mind it's about focusing the mind it's not yes it's to do with focusing the mind as as i say whether you're focusing it on a candle or on a mantra or on a tai chi move it's about focusing the mind um and by focusing the mind it strengthens it whereas normally where we, we talk about the monkey mind you know humans we have a very scattered mind going every direction when we're meditating it focuses it's like a laser beam well i heard a uh, one of the two hospice ladies, I can't remember her name, but there's only two women that are really famous for doing hospice work. You probably know both of them, but um, I can't remember their names. But I just remember her saying one time, uh, she was giving a speech about her work in the hospice, and she would listen to people tell their stories as they're dying. And in the story she told, she was up on a stage, up uh, in front of a podium or up in front of a crowd, and she was telling about her life's work. And she said that at some point in her life, uh, she got the cosmic consciousness uh, thing going, and she, her awareness expanded into a cosmic consciousness state. And she said it lasted for a couple of weeks. And wow she couldn't figure out why it happened or why it lasted so long. And she'd never been into meditation. She would never tried to meditate. And so she couldn't figure out why she got this cosmic state because people spend their whole lives trying to reach a higher state. And she was never doing that. And she couldn't figure out, well, why did I get this awesome higher state if I haven't been trying to get it? And so after, <laughs> After the speech uh, was over, she this these monks came up that her, listened to her speech and she, and they explained to her the reason why you had this um, higher state is because you spent your life focusing your awareness on listening to people's stories as they're dying. You're you're not doing a formal meditation; you're doing an yeah. informal meditation, but it's still. A, a type of focus yes. so that's why you've you've gotten this higher mind state because you've done a non-formal uh form of focus and yeah. i just thought that was really odd that uh, that you know that that you don't have to have formal meditation you can as long as you're doing any form of meditation or focus any form of focus you're yeah. still doing a form of meditation even though it's not formal yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, you're at the age of 30. You've been pulled out of your body. You're uh, talking to three grays for an hour telepathically. They've explained to you about your uh, need to learn Tai Chi. D did they mention Qigong at all? Oh, they, no, they basically said Tai Chi. Okay. Yeah. See, then, it, it wouldn't have made any difference because I'd never heard of this anyway. So, they, so I think they, they were trying to keep would, it as simple as they could. You wouldn't have known what they were talking about. <laughs> no, it, it's like the, the uh, natural healing modality that they actually referred to was Reiki. Uh, but, I mean, it wasn't even in Australia then, so there was no point in them getting me more confused. So they basically just let it unfold for me. But I, know, I learned that years later. Um, but, again, I could see the whole thing had been so orchestrated um so that was so, an actual healing modality they were talking about so after this third experience at the age of 30 where you've talked we were talking telepathically with these three beings for an hour 
what was your next experience after that? Um, I'm just trying to think. Well, the next, the next few years I did spend doing the study, and um, it was all very choreographed from behind the scenes, the amount of study that I was able to do. Um, so I spent two years training as a med uh, Tai Chi teacher to go out now, now I teach. Um, and I was also in this meditation circle, learning automatic writing, which I didn't know then, but that was preparation for me to write the books. Um, and a, a fellow came along to my Tai Chi class who had just done level one in Reiki. And I'd been learning spiritual healing in the meditation group, just hands-on healing. And he started talking about this Reiki and I pricked my ears up because it sounded very interesting. And there were several very experienced healers in the meditation group. And before we started meditation, we all used to be in a circle, holding hands and saying the Lord's Prayer. And I could remember the heat coming out of these at the hands of these spiritual healers. Anyway, this fellow who'd done level one Reiki also joined the meditation group. He was keen to you know, get into these things. And on the first night he was present, he happened to be sitting next to me, took his hand, and the heat that was coming out of it just blew my mind. So I thought to myself, wow, I'm going to have to look at this Reiki. And the other thing was, when we were doing spiritual healing, um, on one occasion, I was going around the circle doing it with several people. And when I'd finished, I came back to my seat and sat down, and I had a really sore finger. It had suddenly developed. And I jokingly said, you know, who's hurt their finger in the group? You know, I've picked up on it. And one of the fellows burst out laughing and he said, oh, it was me. He said, I hit my finger with a hammer today. I was feeling really good now. And I'd taken it on. And I didn't like the idea of this. Um, so when I heard about Reiki, because to learn Reiki, you have to go through an attunement process, which gives you protection. So you don't take things on like that when you're doing healing. Um, a lot of the healers in this circle were starting to get sick themselves because they were using too much of their own energy. Whereas when you're attuned to Reiki, you just draw energy straight through the crown chakra, down to the heart chakra, down through the heart meridians. So you're not taking any of your own energy out, which, which is what I learned eventually. Um, so this was why I started taking notice. And um, this fellow in the, in the group went on to learn Reiki 2, Reiki 3. So he became a, a Reiki teacher. And I ended up then going to him. We became friends and um, I learned Reiki off him and went right through to master level. Um, so now I'm a Reiki master, so I can teach as well. So how long did it take you to learn all of the Reiki that you learned? Oh, years, years. This learning Reiki one, two and three in one weekend is absolutely not, not on. Um, it's What happens with Reiki is it, it um, brings your energy system, the chakra system, back into balance. So after you learn each level of Reiki, you have to go through what's called a 21-day cleanse, which helps to detox the energy system so it can come up to a higher frequency. It's raising the frequency of the energy system. Um, so I did Reiki 1 um, in about March of that year. I was able to do Reiki 2 about three months later because I had been doing spiritual healing and and meditation, Tai Chi, so I've been doing a lot of spiritual work. Master level took me years. I didn't do that for many years. I just worked as a practitioner for a long time. So the whole thing took, my goodness, we moved back to town in about 1986. Um, I'm just trying to think. I started teaching Tai Chi in about 1989, learned Reiki 1 in 1993, I think it was. And I think I did master level in about 1996 or 97. So the whole thing took quite a long time. Through all that, I was still performing as a dancer. I didn't stop doing that until about the year 2000. So my life was pretty full um, during that time. I was very concentrated down here doing earth human study work. So I wasn't aware of doing that much up on the ship then. That came later. So when you say you're doing study work, what exactly were you studying? Studying energy, energy through the oh, okay, chi okay. through the Reiki. All right, all right. So yeah, uh, just for a moment there, I got divorced from, uh, <laughs> you know, you're you're doing all this energy work, but then you said study, and I think of study like 
scientific study or school study, but you know, I kind of divorced my mind there for a second from your energy work. All right, so um, that's just my own confusion. So uh, <laughs> at, at the age of 30, you had your third experience. You got pulled out of your body. You had an hour long experience and then go go to your uh, next experience after that one. Okay, um, next experience would have been um, in 1995 when I went over to the UK, my brother and his wife were going over there and I went with them. And um, we have a cousin over there who's involved with um, archeology span and her husband is what's called a rescue archeologist in that if let's say, for example, they wanna do a housing development somewhere, they bring in a rescue archeologist to check out the area to make sure that there's nothing that mustn't be touched because you know, in the UK with Stonehenge and Avebury and all those sacred sites, if you're careful of that. Anyway, um, this cousin contacted me who was living over there and she said, well, what would you like to do while you're over, over here? Because I'd met her, she'd been to Australia many years before, so I knew her. And I said, oh, I want to see some sacred sites. I love to see Stonehenge, I love to see Avery. And she said, okay, we'll, we'll you know, organise that. But she said, you must come to the Roll Right Stones. That's the circle where it's, it's a sacred circle on the Warwickshire, Oxfordshire border. And her husband had been doing a lot of work there. They were sort of caretakers of this, this, this sacred site. So we arranged to go there. Um, and unbeknown to me, I didn't even realise it at the time until I went and looked back at my travel notes, we were there on the day of the summer solstice. And um, I happened to be standing right in the middle of the main circle there, which is called the King's Men, at 12 noon, the day of the summer solstice. And I was very, very aware of the, you know, the energy in the circle. There was an elderly caretaker there who was talking to me about how at dawn you can see energy within the circle and he was explaining it all. And I stood in the centre of the circle and sort of shut my eyes and felt a slight rocket sensation. Um, all very, very, very interesting. Anyway, we came back to Australia and I felt different. When I was doing Tai Chi and meditation, I was aware of going to a much deeper state and I just felt different. I thought at first I had jet lag. <laughs> But it just went on and on. Anyway, three weeks almost to the day I had stood in a circle. Um, one night back in Australia, I was very consciously aware of being taken out of my body and put into, um, I think they call it a tumbrel. It's like an old, old type of carriage with solid wooden wheels. And I was taken and put into this by some people, taken back to the roll right stone circle, taken out of the little carriage thing, laid down in the centre of the circle where I'd actually physically stood there weeks before, held down very hard by some small beings. Um, I couldn't quite tell whether they were greys or fairy folk, nature spirits, because this circle has a very strong um, nature spirit tradition connected with it. I now realise that they were both. <laughs> Um, but they look like little greys and they held me down and a needle about that long with a huge blue facet of crystal on the end was put into my third eye chakra point. It hurt like anything. I was struggling and yelling, ow, ow, it's hurting, take it out, take it out. I was, I was really, <laughs> it was a bit scary. Um, so when I told them to take it out, they did. I blanked out after that, didn't know anything else. The next morning I woke up in bed, very, very aware of this, what had happened, being held down and this, this needle being put into my chakra. So I thought, oh, it's just a dream. Got up and looked in the mirror and there was a red crescent shaped mark right on the third eye point um, to prove that no, it wasn't a dream. So anyway, by then, I was starting to get a little bit more contact, a little bit more conscious memory of being taken up on the ship with the ETs. So I asked them when I was there what it was about, and I was told that they had downloaded a lot of information into my conscious mind that was going to start coming out over the next few years, and they wanted me to start writing books 
on ET contact, but they wanted me to write them from the ET perspective rather than from the Earth human perspective because there was a, a lot of books being written back then on it, but a lot of fear involved. Always, you know, oh, I've been abducted by aliens and all this sort of thing. And the ETs wanted their side of the story put out. Um, and so this was what it was about. All this information was contained in this crystal and um, it was put into my third eye chakra point. Um, so not long after that, I started getting an urge to start writing the books. So that was what my fourth experience was about. What age were you at? Uh, when you had this fourth experience? Ah, uh, 42. Okay, and hold on a second. I'm going to turn on my light if it, if I can just, there we go. All right, um, so you're at the age of 42. You you have your fourth experience. You get pulled out of your body again, which is, a, uh, you know, it's kind of unusual. You know, you hear you hear people having experiences and stuff, but you, you don't really associate uh, the grades with pulling people out of their bodies. That's that's yeah. it wasn't something that's a connection I've never made before until you just made it. So um, you were at you had gone to one of the um, the circles, not the yeah, like not Stonehenge itself. One of the other circles. Oh, the stone. We went to Stonehenge. There was Avery, but this this circle that we went to was the Roll Right Stones. It's called. And it's a stone circle. It's not a. It's yes. not a wooden circle. That's a stone circle. And how can you describe the what it looks like now? Oh yeah, look. There's there's three parts to it. We went to the circle called the King's Men. Um, I've got photos. It's it's you know, a group of circles about, oh, wow, how wide would it be? I'm not very good at guessing, but, yeah, it's quite a big circle. There's another um, section over the road um, called um, the King Stone, which is a single menier, I think they call it, and it's been erected on a fairy knoll, one of the most famous fairy knolls in England, and it's overlooking the village of Long Compton, which was very, very um, highly populated with um practitioners of the old um, art in a wicker. Um, so it's got a very, very strong fairy um, tradition connected with the whole thing. There's another circle called the Five Knights, I think it's called. We didn't get there. The main circle I was in was called King's Men. So um, are you aware of uh, who built uh, Stonehenge itself? Um, not really. Um, I'm sure it, there would have been ET help there for sure because, I mean, it's like the pyramids in Egypt, you know, the size of the stones. They didn't have equipment back then. I think they'd be flat out building those things now. So, that, you know, there would have been ET help down here back then. Okay, so uh, you're, take us, go back for a moment to the fourth experience and uh, you're out of your body. Uh Go through that experience, if you can, from the moment you're pulled out of your body to the part where they stick the crystal in your third eye. What, what, uh, how long was, how long did the experience last? First oh, look, I have no idea. It happened during the night, um, and I just fell back to sleep again, so I don't know. Um, but, but you, you remember know, there's, there's seats. Because you're out of your body, you don't have a sense of time. I mean, time applies down here, but when you're out of your body, there's no sense of time. Okay. So you are you had gone to the UK. You had visited the same circle they took you to yeah. prior to your being pulled out of your body and taken back to that same circle. Yeah. So um, why um, – obviously, they could have put, in, put the crystal in your third eye anywhere – why do you believe they took you to that particular, you know, they could have taken you to Stonehenge, they could have taken you to the moon, they could have taken you anywhere. Why do you think they took you to that particular location? Why do you think that was? Well, we have a connection with it in this life, and I think that I have a connection with it from the past, past life. I think that I might have been like one of the practitioners of, of um, the nature religion back then. So I think that probably that's why they took me back there. 
because I, I can feel a real link with it. I felt it, I was aware of it consciously when I was over there. Yeah, sure, we visited Stonehenge, we visited Avery, they were lovely, um, but I felt a real connection with the Royal Right Circle. So there's an energy connection there. So spell it, we're all right, how do you spell that? R-O-L-L-R-I-G-H-T. Roll right. Roll right. Roll right. R-O-L-L-R-I-G-H-T. Roll right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to hear it. It's just the way, you know, it kind of flows together. Um, yeah. So when you say um, it was the fairies and the greys, uh, what is the connection between the fairies and the greys? What I know the we all, all on before you answer. Uh, we all know that fairies are earth spirits, and we all know that ETs are ETs. But uh, if you could explain their connection, that would be nice. Well, there's actually a race of greys, a grey culture living on Earth many, many millions of years ago. So some of the greys have a connection with Earth. And because the greys are insectoid rather than mammalian, like Earth humans are, they're out of an insectoid um, background, whereas humans are out of a mammalian background. And the insectoid kingdom is closely related to the diva kingdom. The insectoids down here are like a physical manifestation of the diva kingdom. Um, and the gray, so therefore the greys are more closely related to the davas than they are to humans. Oh, because so what you're saying is is that insects or insectoid races like the insects of Earth are closer to the nature than yeah than we are. So yeah, saying. yeah, yeah. This early race of greys that was down here, I refer to them as the ant people, and they've got uh, quite a, they're, they're quite well known by some of the Native American um, groups. They were known as the gardeners of the earth, and they actually assisted with the um, eco structure of um, planet earth when it was being developed for other life forms to be able to live here. This group of beings called ant people, um, and they evolved on to becoming what people think of now as grave. Some of them actually moved to the Zeta Reticulan star system. But so they still have that nature spirit connection. So you what you're saying is is the ancient Earth living uh, race that we today call the ant people are a predecessor to the grey race? Some of the greys, yes. Yes. Greys have developed all over the universe, but there is one group that developed here on Earth. So the ant people graze how how are they're not the same as the zetas they're yeah uh, they are the zetas they, they, they are the zetas. to live in the zeta system oh yeah. okay so the the ant people race is the predecessor to the zeta gray race yes yeah, some of the zetas okay see, so, see what's confusing people don't realize there's there's i, I use the term gray to differentiate between insectoid type humans and mammalian type humans so um that's what, the only reason i use the term gray the zetas are a gray race but there are many many different races of grays throughout the universe and even in the zeta reticular system there's about 30 different races there's many many different ones it's like on on earth you know we've got english people american people french people you know throughout the universe it's the same thing um and on earth it's very rare to get a person who was just absolutely pure American or pure Australian. We all have different family backgrounds. You know, some of us have Italian ancestry or, or um, Indian ancestry or whatever. In the universe, it's the same. So many are hybrids. Very, very rare to get someone absolutely pure. So you're saying that there are um, as many as 30 different Zeta races? Oh, many, 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 yeah. Okay, so how many, um, let me see if I can raise my light a little bit. Okay, so how many in general, I mean, I hear lots of different numbers when people talk about greys. Uh, there's a there's a fellow, you probably know his name, I'm sure you know his name, who, um, and I can't remember it, I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head. He's, he made the statement like he said something to the fact that there's 39 races of greys uh, uh, dealing with Earth right now, and 
38 of them don't abduct people and one does and something of that nature. I don't remember the exact, I don't remember his name and I don't remember exactly the, the exact statement he said, but um, if somebody tried to pin you down to uh, how many uh, gray races there are that you're aware of, um, not necessarily that you've interacted with or anything, but just that you have knowledge of how many gray, not just Zeta, but gray in general races, would you say uh, that you're aware of that exist? Oh, look, it'd be really hard to say. I'm, I'm, I'm only aware of the group I work with. Um, I know of about three different ones, but I know that there are many, many more. Okay, so but you, there's no way to come up with any number, even a no. bit. But it, would you say that it's millions of races? Uh, not, not of race. There, there'd be millions of different ET types throughout the universe. How um, many grays? Well, I know of about thirty in the Zeta reticular system, um, but I know that there. Are, I know there are others out there, but I don't know a lot about them. You know, it's okay. that's, that that side of it doesn't concern me. I work more with the energy thing and bridging the work, the group, the group that I work with, with bridging them with humans. Okay, well then, go on with uh, your. You were just. Let's see. Uh, let me see if I get this straight. You've had uh, the age, the the. Um, Event the age of three, then the one at fifteen, then the one at thirty, then one at forty-two, and at the forty when you're forty-two, that's when they took you to the circle, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's make sure I'm getting all this straight. So uh, after the age of forty-two, what was your next uh, experience? Okay, well, what what happened then? I was teaching Tai Chi and Reiki, um, and in the year two thousand, when I was about oh, goodness forty eight, I think, <laughs> um, I was working with my Reiki teacher, and he had attuned a woman by the name of Helene Kay to Reiki. Um, she she and her husband had a family business, so were um, building camper vans and uh, not into the stuff at all, nothing whatsoever. And after she was, she, she decided to learn Reiki because her two children were suffering from asthma. And I think uh, her husband had a, an aunt or someone who did Reiki. And a couple of times his aunt came over, gave the children Reiki and it really helped them. So Helene decided to learn. Um, anyway. The whole, whole family enjoyed getting Reiki treatment so much. The two children and husband all decided they wanted to learn. So they did Reiki 1, whereas Helene had gone on by then to Reiki 2. Anyway, within a week of them being attuned to Reiki, the children started <coughs> having nightmares and night terrors of these beings coming into their room. And the parents had actually saw light coming in through their skylight and heard beeping noises. So, you know, they were starting to get scared, wondering what was going on. So they contacted the Reiki teacher to come in and give the house a cleanse. Now, doing a Reiki cleanse on a house, if there's ever any negative energy, it will clear it. I've done this several times and it's brilliant for clearing negative energy. So he came and visited them, did the Reiki cleanse, but the activity got worse, stronger. So anyway, he was heading off on a holiday, didn't know what to do, so he contacted me because I was aware by then that I was having contact with ETs. I was having a few sort of vague memories coming through. Um, and as he described what was going on in the house, I had a feeling it was ET activity, and I said this to him. So he said, look, can I, can I give this woman your phone number so she can ring you because she's absolutely terrified. So I said, yes, yeah, sure, no worries. Anyway, Helene rang me the next day and we talked. And up until that point, I'd been aware of having contact with ETs, but I hadn't spoken to anyone because, you know, it's not the sort of thing that you talk about. And so I felt a bit nervous talking about it and coming, starting to come out in the open about it. But anyway, immediately I recognised Helene when she spoke to me on the phone and I had never met her. Um, but I just immediately, I recognised the voice and I spoke to her about it and she was immediately fine with it and she started to feel better because I said, look, 
it sounds like to me ET activity. And I said, I've had this all my life. I've, I've never been hurt by them. And one of the figures that the children described standing in the corner of the room dressed in black sounded like the ET teacher that I was then aware of. So anyway, Helena and I got to know each other quite well over a number of <coughs> phone conversations. And this activity in their house really started to shake off. And as I said to her, the greys love Reiki. They love the energy of Reiki because they love the positive energy. So yeah, all the family being attuned to Reiki would have brought them in. This made huge sense. And they were trying to contact the children. So um, I advised Helene to keep a diary of the nightly activities. And um, this is what our book, Zeta Message, this one here, ended up being all about. Um, a lot of it is diary notes from Helene's experiences in their home and the children's experiences. Their daughter, Kira, was being taken up on the ship consciously just about every night. Um, and she used to see me up there. And so the more I spoke with Kira, and um, we sort of exchanged things. I realised she was giving, being given the same teachings that I'd been given through the automatic writing. Um, and uh, it started sort of jogging more memories with me as well of being up there. So this is, this is what was happening. This was sort of my next contact experience, linking with this family and helping them through the fear of this contact, ongoing contact that was happening. So... Um... How old were you when this? Obviously, you're older than 42. Uh, 48. I was 48 when this 48. happened. Okay. And um, you had a friend. She was the connection that connected you to the lady who was having the, her daughter taken on board. Uh, your connection with the lady that connected you with the. Yeah, my, the Tai Chi teacher. I, we, we both learned Tai Chi off the same person. Oh, okay. So, so he, con he connected us up. Oh, so your Tai Chi teacher connected you with his family. With this, yeah, because he knew I was having ET contact experiences. And as he described what was going on with the family, bells were going off in my head because they were describing what these beings looked like. And I said, oh, I'm sure they're greys. I'm sure they're having ET contact. And so he said, well, look, can, can you speak to her? And that's what I did. So, um, okay, so who was doing the house clearing before you got involved of that family? Um, the Tai Chi teacher. Okay. And did he ever, did he describe what was there before he did the Reiki, why he did the house clearing in the first place? Uh, well, they called him in because this activity had started up in their home. After they were attuned to Reiki, the kids started seeing these beings standing in the corner of their room and they could see flashing lights through the skylight. So it was obviously ET contact started up after they'd been attuned to Reiki, which it can happen. Okay. Um, I know, like after I was attuned, I opened up more to it too. So you're saying that if humans want to have ET experiences, all they got to do is learn Reiki? Oh, not necessarily. You know, you've got, you've got to, it's not you've quite got that to, easy, is it? Yeah, no, not, not quite that easy. You have to have agreed to it as a pre-birth thing. <laughs> oh, seriously. So, so you can't just go learn Reiki and you're going to have contact? Uh, well, in some cases, with some people, if they have agreed to it, they can. So the, the Reiki just helps because it raises your vibrational frequency to be able to open yourself up to more, more of it. Many people are having contact, they're not even consciously aware. But once you're tuned to Reiki, it raises your energy frequency, and so you become more consciously aware. So you've got me interested in Reiki now. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I'm, yeah, um, have my own things. Anyway, um, so back to you. Let's see, you're 48 now. You've, you, you're a Reiki teacher got you connected to a family who was learning Reiki from him. Yeah. Uh, they were started having experiences with the Greys. Yeah. And or the Zetas, should I call them Zetas? So that, uh, you know, even that's not going to, 
Uh, they, they, don't, they don't mind. We actually ask through the daughter. The daughter established very, very strong conscious contact with them. And on one occasion, we asked, we said, what do you like being called? Do you like being called ETs or greys or Zetas or, or what? Or aliens or what? And um, the teacher, Oris, who we started working with, he said, look, we don't care what you call us, but please don't call us aliens. We don't like that because it's too much them and us. So we respect that. I, I, I cringe when I hear the word alien. <laughs> So, so you call them uh, greys or zetas? Yeah, or? I, I tend to call them greys because they're not all from the zeta reticuli system, but they don't care. Okay, so the the race that um, that you're referring to now, mm. uh, do they look like um, Whitley's greys? Uh, there was yeah, the yeah, you're real classic greys. Yeah, some of them are tall, some medium height, and some of the little ones. But you're talking about the same race that was on the cover of his book. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly one of them. Okay. And um, you're 48. You you went, did you physically go to this family's house? Yes, yes. And you talked to the daughter and the mother. And Yeah, I mean, they, they, they actually came to me first. We sat down and talked. They came and visited me. I, I did visit them later, um, but they came to visit me. Okay, so... Um, when you went uh, after they came to visit you, you then went to their house after that, right? Yeah. And what did you did? Did their house feel any different from any other any other people's house? No, no, not really. Um, very, very ordinary suburban house. Um, and as I say, they'd never been into any of the stuff at all. And it was really funny because um, I visited them. Oh, it's, it's a little bit complex to try and remember. I've told the whole story of the Zeta message, but it was the anniversary of some other contact I'd had with, with the Greys. I'm just trying to think what it was. Um, I think that's right. I think I visited them on the same day that I had been at the Circle over in England, and I didn't realise it until I got there, and um, we started talking about it, and one of the tall grey teachers who was working with their daughter came through and he said, yes, you're right, it's the same day. I think that was what it was. I can't remember now after we read the book. I haven't read my own book in quite a few years, so I forget. So um, I think you're now speaking about one of the greys with a name. Is that correct? Yes. Well, he uses that name, Aura, so that we can identify him. Aura as in A-U-R-A? O-R-I-S, Aura's. Oris. Okay. Oris. O-R-I-S. And he, he used that name only because humans like using names. Yes, humans like using names. It's just a polite thing on from their part to give us a name. So in his world, nobody calls him Oris. It's only from our world. That... Well, he would vibrate on a frequency that would resonate with that name. It's, it's so hard to put into words because we're talking about energy frequencies. And so um, is there... Is there a particular grey that you have the greatest affinity to? That, that yes. you know, if you, let's say every grey you've ever met in your whole life was all standing in one room with you at the same time. Would one of them stand out as being your friend or somebody that that is closer to you than the rest of them? Yes, the, the one that I work with is called Maris. M A R I S. But he's actually, and Aurus is the same, he's actually a higher part of my own being. So, <laughs> now, so, now we're getting into guitar. All right, now we're getting interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and, and explain. <laughs> okay. One of the main teachings that they gave us was what they refer to as the human ladder. And what the human ladder is, is 10 levels of expanding conscious awareness. Um, and all of us are living lives on all of these levels at the same time. In, in the greater reality, there is no time. It's all in the now. So we're having multiple lives on every level of the ladder. So often when we have an ET come to us as a teacher or an elder who we feel really comfortable with, it's actually part of our own self from a higher level of the ladder. So that's what Maris is with me. Aline's daughter, Kira, Oris, was that with her, a higher level of her own being. 
So what you're saying is, is that part of you is Mars? Yeah. Okay, so... It it's would... like a part of my soul. It's, just, it's like a higher self, a soul, and that so, soul manifests on different levels. So is it even possible for you and Mars to exist in the same room at the same time? Yeah, yeah. It is? Yeah. You're the same being... And that is a... Because we're energy. It's all to do with energy. Our physical body is only like a vehicle. It's only like a car. In, a, in reality, we're, we are energy. Okay, so uh, you're 48. You, uh, you um, have been introduced to a family who is having ongoing contact. The daughter, is she public yet? No, no. Okay. Daughter. No. I, I speak about her in the book. It, okay. It's all in the in the she, she, But you use a different name. It's not a real name. Oh uh, yeah. Okay, but she hasn't gone public. Well, <laughs> if you ever if she ever says she wants to go public, uh, you know who, who to tell her to call, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you're 48. You you run into this family, and you realize they're having ongoing contact, and uh, can you speak a little bit about um, the daughter and the family in general and what, how this is all playing out in their life? Yes, well, both the children uh, were having contact. They had a, a son, uh, Ben, who was seven when it started. The daughter, Kira, was, uh, I think she was about 11 or 12 when it first started. Um, and it actually started with the son having night terrors. Um, he'd go into a sort of an altered state and his mum would have to, you know, he'd be screaming in terror and his mum would go in and try and talk to him and bring him out of it. And this went on for quite a number of years until eventually he made more physical contact with one of the greys. Um, she took him by the hands and that helped to wake him up and he lost his fear after that. He was fine. The daughter, on the other hand, who was the older one of the two, she felt fine with it, um, and she had a lot of conscious memory of being taken up on the ship, and she used to see me up there, because I work up there, um, and she'd see them you know, in, the, in her room, they'd come in, the, he'd take, the teacher would take her off to you know, on various adventures around the universe. Um, and this went on for quite a few years with them. It went on for about three years until the daughter got to about age 15 and then it just started tapering off because they wanted her to just get on with her normal life. So, um, so they're not, not only not malevolent, they're very positive, is what you're very saying. Very positive, very positive. Um, there is a malevolent group, but they are from down here. They're not genuine ETs. They're being created by a group down here. Dr. Stephen Greer talks about this a lot. Um, the genuine greys are fine, as are the off-planet reptilians. They're fine. But there's a group down here that are not so good. Um, Stephen Greer refers to them as PLFs, Programmed Life Forms. And they've actually been, they're part of the MyLab um, thing, the military abduction program, um, and they've been created out of genetic material that was taken from genuine ETs whose bodies have been retrieved from the crash disks. They've retrieved genetic material and they also have back engineered technology from the disks. And they've developed technology down here on Earth that can fool people into thinking that they're being abducted by negative aliens. And they've made these beings in the form of greys to make people scared of the genuine greys who are only here to help. So, um, are you saying you agree with him that, that okay, so obviously even the positive greys are taking people. That's a fact. Mm. Yes. Mm. Okay. So, um, But you don't totally agree with Stephen in the sense that, um, how do I put this? Um, you run into people like, um, like, oh God, um, the I'm 
don't know why I'm blanking on his name. <laughs> the the guy, the alien hunter. Um, you know who I'm talking about? No. Uh, there's so many of them. Well, the there's only there one a... person that I know of that they call him the alien hunter. Oh, I've never heard so that. One of his clients was a client of mine. Um, uh, anyway, he he tries to say that all aliens are bad and. Uh, oh, David David Jacobs. No, no, no. He's worse than David. Uh, um, David says that they're going to take over the world. And and I actually ran in. I per, had a personal inter, uh, interview for like 20, 30 minutes with a lady who was an abductee. And I went to a MUFON meeting, and she, she and I were the only ones that showed up. Everybody, everybody decided not to show up in this meeting. Uh, except for her, myself, her husband, and her son. Wow. wow. We're the only ones that showed up at the meeting. Her, her husband and her son were in the in the um, library, and it was just her and me sitting there talking about uh, her abduction experiences for 20 minutes until she left. And uh, But I asked her about quite a few questions, but the only question that's relevant to our conversation is I asked her if the Greys were really going to take over the world, and she said she said uh, she said yes they would, but but it wasn't um, it wasn't like David talks about it. She said they were going to populate the world, but it wasn't. It's not like he explains it. Um, he's not re- he's not aware of time frames, and uh, she was. She said that, yes, they will populate the earth, but uh, nobody alive today will be alive then. Your kids won't be alive then. Your kids' kids won't be alive then. <laughs> this is like five or six generations down the road. And at that time on the earth, it's so far into the future that there's very few humans still on the earth. So when they repopulate the earth, it's not a taking our place event it's a repopulating of a planet that's no longer that has like maybe one percent one percent of today's population is there and then they start repopulating so it's a it's not a replacement of yeah repopulating of a planet that's no longer populated Mm -hmm. it's it's totally different from the way he puts it yeah so um anyway i just thought i would make that point because I try to make that point whenever it seems relevant as often as I can uh, in reference to what he tells people. I'm not trying to say he's a liar. I'm just saying he doesn't understand time frames. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, you're 48. You come across the family that is uh, having experiences. And go on with the rest of your experience. What's the After that, what's the next experience? Well, I, I'm... I sort of have ongoing experiences. Um, I could only bring a certain amount back because of the fact that I'm in an Earth human body, so I can only access 10% of my consciousness, but occasionally I'm allowed to remember what goes on upstairs. Um, And I am aware of going up on the ship on a fairly regular basis, Um, but there are just a couple of things that really stand out that I remember. Um, One of the most significant ones was um, being up there in my grey form, because I take that form up there, and um, we had a birth human man brought on board because we had to do some healing work on him. And I remember walking into the clinic up on the ship and he was in there, sort of half paralysed, but he was able to move his eyes and he caught sight of me, an absolute look of terror on his face. He was absolutely petrified. And he'd been taken up on a fairly regular basis. Um, I mean, we never hurt him. And I was trying to communicate with him and say, look, you know, we're here to help you. He'd actually had an implant put in from the negative group down here. um, And we were going to remove it to help him. Um, But I couldn't get through to him because he was wrapped in this cocoon of fear. I I kept saying, look, it's okay. It's okay. We're not going to hurt you. Don't be scared. But he couldn't couldn't 
hear what I'm saying. Because when a, when a person's in that state, they can't pick up on telepathy. So anyway, one of the others, I think they placed their hands on his head just to, you know, anaesthetize him. And he was lying on the table. There were three of us working on him. And I can remember very clearly putting my long, I have four fingers that, in that body, I don't have five, and they're much longer than my human fingers. And I could remember going down inside the top of his head uh, to undo this implant um, and you know, cut it or whatever, to remove it, pulling it out of his head and then saying to the others, that's good, we've got rid of that, he should be safe now. And I remember uh, looking at him and he had a very distinctive, he had like a moustache and beard going around in a circle. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, if I ever see you, I'll recognise you. Um, and funnily enough, some years later, I did actually see a photo of him. <laughs> but that, that is one memory that I have really, really clear of working on this earth human man, taking this implant out of his head. So the implant you t removed was an energetic implant. Mm, uh, no, it was actually a physical. It was a physical one. Okay. So it was from down here. It wasn't an. I mean, there's energy involved, but it was it was something physical. I took out. Okay, so you when you took it out, you were in the form of Morris. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was an ET. So you weren't. You weren't. You were aware of what was going on but you were yeah. not a human you were an et yeah, at the time. An ET. yeah. okay yeah. all right so when you took it out can you explain uh exactly what you did well uh, no it's very hard to explain i mean it was a long time ago all i can remember was my fingers going down i can still visualize i, I can still visualize myself there the two others were standing at my right we were grouped around his head and my fingers, I put my fingers down through the top of his head and I can remember sort of fiddling around trying to undo it. It was a little bit hard to, I can't remember if I broke it or I cut it or something, but I had to disconnect it and pulled it out. I can remember doing that, holding it up. Oh, here it is. Look at, look at that. You know, now he'll be safe. Thank goodness we got it because we were aware that it had been put in by this negative group down here. So when you took it out, you weren't surgically removing it. You were reach. You were dematerializing part of your yeah. hum, your ET hand and sticking yeah. your dematerialized hand through his the top of his skull down yeah. and, and grabbing. Uh, yeah. It was partially the hand was partially uh, inside his head. Well, when I say it was partially material and partially non-material, is it? Is it? Is it? It wasn't. It was dematerialized enough to go through his skull, but yeah. it was material enough to grab the, the yeah. The See, when when you're in that altered state up there, they vibrate at a higher frequency than we do. So when you're up there, it it feels physical, but it's not 3D physical. It's higher physicality. This is really hard to put into words. Okay, so. Um, So it, it was like we were physically working on him, but it was actually at a higher frequency. See, he I, was I get you there I, in his astral I, form. I understand what you're saying. I'm just trying to uh, formulate my next question. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, so you're in a higher frequency. You're saying that when you're on the ship, it's not the same frequency level as when you're in your body now. It's a different. No, that's place. right. That's right. Okay, and it, but it's still the physical plane. It's not the astral plane. It's still the physical plane. Yes. Well, to, for us down here, it is the astral plane. But when you're in that astral plane, it's physical there. I understand. I'm just saying. Okay, so you're you're on the ship. You're in the astral plane, but you're in a. It's all physical. Well, yeah. I, I understand that the astral plane is not um, like a ghost. It has, it has physicality. The astral yeah, yeah, plane is just yeah. physical. See, physical. see it, it's a little bit like when I was taken to England and that operation done on my third eye. I, it, that was my astral body or, or higher spirit body, whatever. And yet when I came back here, I still had the mark on my physical body. So what happens up there 
can also affect the physical body, even though it's not a physical event. As I say, it's really hard to explain. So, um, I think you've just explained how the ETs travel in the universe. They go from the physical plane in the, uh, into the astral plane, move in the astral plane, then come back into the physical plane. Is that is that accurate or not? Well, there's, they don't come into the physical. It's all higher vibrations. So, when you, you're saying that even when they're here in the physical plane, they're still, yeah, they're still at a higher at vibration. Higher. Okay. Um, so, I, I assume you understand um, the various different beings that move to and from the astral plane. The, but not just the the greys, but when I'm when I was, this question I'm asking is about other non ETs that are moving between the physical plane and the astral plane are you like um like as an example the sasquatch would be yes an example. yes yes uh, he the yes. sasquatch moves between he's not uh i know a couple and they say they're like in or um in a remote area of either washington or oregon state and they have this connection with the sasquatches and they say that the Sasquatch looks at us and says, humans are dimensionally locked. Something, yes. there's a term they use, and it's something like that. Yes, stuck. We're stuck in a stuck. particular dimension. Yes. Whereas the greys, the ETs, can move back and forth between dimensions. And exactly. Just like the Sasquatch can move back and can move, can uh, a Sasquatch can like think, I want to be on the other side of the planet, and boom, they disappear right in front of you and, and go to the other side of the planet. And the greys can do the same thing. They can yeah. move yeah. from one planet to the next without yeah. a ship, just with their body and go from place to place. They're not locked. Yeah. Like we are. Yeah. See, what, what people have to understand is all dimensions are right here, right now. Just the same as there's no such thing as time. When you, when you move off planet Earth, there's no time. Everything is just in the now. And all the dimensions are right here, right now. And so... And sometimes, um, like, there'll be a portal between dimensions. So you get, like, a Sasquatch or a Loch Ness monster or something can come through these portals. Um, but with the majority of people on this planet, we are. We're stuck. We can't do that. Um, one of the greys described it once. He said, it's like the universe and all the different dimensions involved. It's like a flowing river. And he said, planet Earth has been sort of, pushed off to the side um, in, a, in a little sort of muddy pond that's been cut off from the main flow of the universe. And this is the reason why the genuine ETs are here, to try and get us back into the flow of the universe. Now, that's something I've never heard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, so you ran into the family, and then you're up on the craft as the ET pulling out a an implant. So describe the implant that you pulled out uh, after you pulled oh, it. Oh, I can't, it can't remember. I can't remember. That's I was okay. I, this little object. I think it had wires coming off of it or something. I've seen a lot of them. Uh, Daryl Sims is the guy. I couldn't remember his name. The ET hunter, the, the, the alien hunter, his name is Daryl Sims, and he likes to... Oh, yeah. He likes to believe that all aliens are, are bad, so uh, I'm I don't agree with him, but uh, I have to just say what he says just to describe who I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, I've seen his I met him a long time ago, and he at that time he had a very very small box of implants, the size of a maybe the, if he took a shoe box and cut it in half. Uh, horizontally and then laid it side by side his original box was about that size mm. and then now he's got a box of implants that's humongous and mm. uh, compared to what he used to have so anyway um, uh, you're you pulled the imp so I've seen a bunch of them as what I was yeah they're, they're all put in from down here 
but the, what you're describing doesn't sound like what I've seen. Mm. So it'd be interesting to see what you were, what you're describing now, what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, get on with your story. The next, you're on the ship pulling the uh, implant out of the, as the ET, you're pulling the, do you know your name as the ET? Did you have a name? Uh, yeah, well, again, I use one, El Lorca. I use that name down here. Say it again. El Lorca. Spell it. E-L-O-R-K-A-H. El Lorca. El Lorca. That's your, that's the name you use to, use, yeah. so that people can reference you. In the ET world, they don't use names at all, do they? No, vibrational frequencies. But I'm not. But I, can, I can translate that frequency into that name. <laughs> yeah, but that's just one race. <clears throat> Some of the other races use names, don't they? Oh, probably, maybe. Okay. All right. So, all right. You you pulled out the 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 implant that was put on into the fellow from Earth. I assume it was to track him. We used to track him. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And uh, go ahead to another experience that you want to impart that you think is worth speaking about. Yeah, look, I, I had an interesting one. Uh, again, I was up there training a couple of the little greys how to use a laser cutter. Um, and I, my body was on the table and I couldn't, I, at first, I thought I was actually sitting up supervising, but I think my body was on the table and I was standing behind it. And they were working on my lower right leg with a laser cutter. And they cut right around the outside of my leg. And I was telling them, OK, if you want to get under, you've got to shift the leg over so you can get it underneath. I was, I was instructing them. And then they had to seal the cut using the laser, um, <clears throat> cutting, like, uh, what do you call it, uh, cauterizing it. And when I woke up the next morning, I could vaguely remember having been up on the ship, but I couldn't remember any of the details at all. I said, well, that's before I was up there. <clears throat> anyway, that day we were going to go to the beach. So I was putting some suntan lotion on the leg. And when I pulled my trouser leg up, I saw this straight cut right around the outside of my lower right leg, and this tiny little blisters sealing it all the way around. And seeing it jogged my memory, and I remember being up there and them doing this. And I thought, you know, what a good, neat job they did. Anyway, I actually had a scar from that for quite a while. It's disappeared now, but I had a scar from it for quite a while because it was quite a deep cut, but there was never any pain involved. So uh, what age were you when they cut your leg? Oh, wow. Well. Gee, I think I was, that was about when I was about 48 too, I think too, somewhere okay. around there. And why did why did you have why did they get, do the surgery on your leg? Where that, where on your leg was it cut? Where exactly? Uh, lo lower right leg, just above the ankle. Just above. Oh, okay. And why that. why did the surgery take place? Uh, they were practicing. They were practicing using a laser cutter and a cauterizer. So, and I let them use my body so they could practice on it. So you were the guinea pig. So they, that wouldn't upset some poor human person who'd been taken up there. I said, I'll use my body. I don't, I don't need it for now. Uh, that was very nice of you to let them practice. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they never use a laser is what you're saying? Oh, well, they, you know, they have to learn to do it, you know, because some of the little ones, you know, they have they have to learn things. You know, they're, some of them are younger and they have to learn how to do things and they have to learn how to use this laser cutter. So they're just like humans. They have to learn it. Martha. Have to learn. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. after the after the uh, and you don't have any scars today. Not now. No, no. I've got a little lump on my third eye from that one where the needle went in. I've got a little lump there, but I haven't got any scars left on my leg. And it was, I, I wish I could have got a picture of it. Back then, we didn't have phone cameras. I didn't even own a camera. And it's really funny, the state of mind you're in when you wake up and find something like that, um, it, it didn't even occur to me. Oh, gee, I wish I could photograph that. It didn't even occur to me. It's so, so weird. I wish I had because it was very impressive. <laughs> Well, I've had things happen to me in my life where, um, you know, that would take a lot of time for me to tell you, but 
they weren't necessarily positive, but if I had had a, um, a smartphone at that time, uh, you know, it would have saved me a lot of hell. Wow. I, if I had had a way to record it, this was before smartphones were invented. So. Yes, yes, me too. Uh, so, uh, any other experiences you'd like to impart uh, after the surgery? Um, we actually had an interesting experience up on the ship just going back to 2019. Um, there were th three of us who worked together up there and a whole huge bunch of Earth humans were brought on board. Um, the ships are actually interdimensional portals and often when people pass away down here or transcend, I don't like to use, to use the word death because it's just a shift of vibration frequency, um, they're often brought onto the ship to be, you know, explain to them about, you know, what's happened and to help them through to wherever they need to go, you know, between lives. And this huge amount of people were, were brought on board and it was honestly, it was like a busy air, airport terminal. It was just chaos. And um, one of the other friends of mine up there was asked to talk to, talk to the people about death. You know, okay, go out there and talk to them about death. And this poor person isn't, that's not their job up there. And they sort of panicked a bit. Oh, my God, that's not my job. <laughs> um, and they're looking around for me because, yes, I do that work up there. And I was down the end of the ship doing something else. Anyway, the three of us could remember it when we woke up the next morning. And this was just prior to the COVID thing because we were all through December of 2019. We were thinking, oh, what's going to happen down here? You know, is it going to be a huge... Um, catastrophe or something, all these people dying. And of course, the next thing was the COVID happened. Um, so I think it was probably to do with that. So, um, would you say the, the bulk of your experiences on the ship, you're a human or an ET? Which are I'm, you most of the time? I'm an ET. Um, I think I can probably take human form up there, but I don't remember doing it. I'm usually an ET. Okay, and um, this last experience to me was, okay, you you were on the ship, you're an ET, and you're, um, there's a, some, it, it's a lot of the people who've passed on, mm, mm. brought onto the ship, and you were tasked, somebody came and grabbed you because you needed to explain to them what it's what the afterlife is like. Yeah, well, we we're all working, we we're all sort of working together, trying to direct them and explain to them what was happening. Um, and one of the people who isn't um, usually involved in that was called on because we were all so busy. Everyone was just flat out, as I say, it was like a busy aircraft terminal. Um, one of our people who doesn't do that work, we were trying to get her and to, to do it and she said oh my god I don't do that that's not my job <laughs> today I had to talk about death um but yeah that's, that's so the job that we do up there can you explain to humans now everything in the universe about the afterlife at this moment <laughs> oh look we've been, if they want to know they should go into our podcast <laughs> the Zeta Messenger we've been actually doing podcasts on that subject over the last few years. Um, the main thing that people need to understand is, um, and even for your life down here, it's important to understand we create our own reality. So therefore, if you've been brainwashed as people have down here through various religions and politics, etc. So if you believe, you know, you're going to come up against a judgmental God figure sitting on a throne who's going to send you to hell or heaven, that's what the first thing you will experience. Until you start to realise that you know, something here doesn't feel quite right and you start to wake up, then you'll get genuine helpers come through to guide you into where you need to go. Um, but um, whatever you believe when you die, that's what the first thing you experience. So if you if you don't believe in anything, you'll first experience blackness when you go over. Uh, well, I just experienced lightning, thunder, or a uh, very loud gunshot, one of the two. I don't think it was because I believed it. <laughs> I think it actually occurred. 
I think there's <laughs> a storm. There's probably a storm moving this way. Yeah, I think I saw a bit of lightning flashing on your face. Did you really? Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. see the. I didn't it, see. It the happened lightning. so fast. I thought, oh, what's that? And it disappeared. <laughs> uh, so, have you? Um, it sounds like you're an expert on the grays. Are you an expert on the afterlife also? Um, I can only remember so much because, as I say, I'm working through an earth human 10% conscious brain, so I can't remember that much. But I do know that you you experience what you believe. You create your own reality, and you create your own reality down here, and you create your own reality over there too. So we are all creators in some in some fashion. Mm. Mm. So it's really important, as one of the great teachers sent a teaching through once, he said it's really important to think positive rather than negative because you create your own reality. So if you think negative all the time, you create a, a negative reality for yourself down here. Whereas if you try and think positive, you create a positive reality. Um, so, uh, okay, so you... You, you went and explained to the humans or the people who just passed on the ship that were pulled onto the ship. You explained to them about the afterlife. You remember doing that? Yeah, that, and the fact that they were they had died. You had to explain to them, hey, you're dead. You know, some of them, don't, they come over there and they don't realize they're dead. So we have to say, okay, look, you've left your physical body. You're up here in your spirit form. And that has to be explained to them. So if somebody's on an ET ship and they see their dead re relatives, uh, it's not a, necessarily an illusion. Oh, no. Oh, no. Because remember, the soul's eternal, and we are souls. We're only in a body. Our body is like a car. We're the driver of the car. And we can step out of the car when we're asleep at night um, and come back into it. When we die, we step out of it permanently. Um, but our consciousness is separate to our human brain. As I explain, I think in one of the podcasts, I say you think of it like your lungs and the air we breathe. We're surrounded by air, but we can only access so much depending on how healthy our lungs are. Our lungs can only process a certain amount of air. We can take a full deep breath in, but we can't take all the air in. We can only take what our lungs can cope with. Consciousness is the same. The brain is the physical organ through which we can access consciousness, but we can only access a limited amount. Consciousness is all around us. When we pass away and step out of the physical vehicle, then we can access way more consciousness because we're in the consciousness field as part of it. So have you ever gotten out of your body? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. how many how many times would you say you you remember getting out of your body? Well, I get out of it every night, but I don't always remember. But on one particular one particular occasion, I remember leaving my body in bed, which I do, and I got up out of it and walked past the mirror, and I was still in like a, a human form. My astral body was still in its human form, and I I don't know if you've ever got out of your body and looked down at it, but a common um, reaction is when you look at your body, it's oh yuck, you know that's what I look like. <laughs> um, and this was my reaction when I saw myself in the mirror. And the next thing, I shape shifted into my grey form, and it was a massive relief to see, you know, oh thank God for that. <laughs> now I look better. So it was quite funny, and I gave myself the giggles when I did it. <laughs> so I, I don't remember so, anything after that. So your awareness is. You prefer your gray form over your human form. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I feel more comfortable in it. I feel more at home. It's more me. I feel like I'm living in a, in a, in a play act down here. I'm acting all the time. So do you, do you think you've been a gray longer than you've been a human? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you're, that's where you're, why you're more comfortable with that form yeah, because yeah. – that is more your native form than your human. Yeah, form. yeah, yeah. Okay. I so just I just agreed to go to come down here as part of this mission to help to educate humans about energy, um, and this planetary shift that's going on. The planet's shifting to a higher frequency, and that's why the genuine ETs are here trying to help humans move out of the little stagnant pond and come into the higher frequency of the universe. 
Um, so that's why I'm down here and a number of others of us. So, um, all right, so you've, you were on the ship, you're explaining to some humans that just passed over about the afterlife, telling them that they're dead or they no longer have bodies and, you know, and all that stuff. So do you, what other uh, experiences can you impart, if any, that you'd like to? Oh, gee, I'm just trying to remember. Uh, <laughs> as I say, I was trying to bring them down here into my earth human brain. That, sure. You know, process them. That's very hard. Um, yeah. I can't think of any more off the top of my head. I am aware of being up there. I wake up in the morning and I can remember having been up there teaching or talking about things. I can remember that. Um, I have given healing to people up on the ship. I remember doing that the other night. I was giving someone like a Reiki healing up there. So uh, the ship that... Uh, Obviously, you're going to the same ship over and over, yes? Oh, not necessarily, just, just where, wherever I'm needed. So you're saying There's that sometimes you, sometimes you go to different ships? Mm, yeah. Okay. Wherever we, we've got to work. And so can you describe any of the ships that inside and out, what they look like? Um... I have a lot of trouble bringing the memories back. Um, one thing that I can all I always think of with the ships is the crew quarters. Susie Hansen explained very beautifully in her book about it, about how it's all like molded tunnels and little passages. And I remember um, I've always been fascinated with the architecture of the Greek islands because of this. You know that everything is molded and white. Um, what they call it whitewashed with paint and over so many years it's built up and built up and built up so that all the little archways and things all look like they're molded all out of the same pattern and material and the crew quarters of the ship are rather like that it's sort of all flowing and pure white and molded it's really hard to describe so when you go up uh, on the ship uh, you're saying that you could be on any number of different ships, is what you're saying? Yeah, well, I don't even sort of think about it. You know, I just, I'm just there. It's, it's work, and I'm here. You know, I don't really think, oh, which ship am I on or anything? Oh, so you, you don't like know the size and shape or anything? You just remember? Well, I would do, I would do when I'm there, but I, it's very hard to bring it back. Ah, uh, I see. So, um, when you channeled your three books. Um, who, what were you channeling that wrote the books? Is it your your other aspect of you that that had the knowledge? The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not really it, you're not really channeling, technically speaking. You're just pulling in the information from another aspect of you. Well, most channeling is that anyway. Say again. Yeah, most channeling is that anyway. Most people who are aware of a contact with a spirit being or an ET, it's generally a higher part of their own self. Yeah, I I bet most people don't realize that. Uh, oh, I mean, no. I've had my higher self speak through me. On one occasion, I was in a, a um, I was in an anger management class and I mm. was speaking to this fellow and I started... Um, telling him things about him that I didn't know myself. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't really channeling. I was just, that was my higher self speaking or some other aspect of me that's not the normal me yeah. speaking to him. And I didn't know these things. I was like, where did that come from? <laughs> Uh, I, I feel that when I go back and read my books. It's all, gee, did I write that? I don't remember writing that. <laughs> so were you in an altered state when you wrote your books? Yeah, I, I must have been because, yeah, I've got to, like, I've got to get into the right state to be able to do it. And as I start writing, it just starts flowing. And then I, I go back and read it and, oh, wow, you know, I don't quite remember writing it. So, yeah, I must be in an altered state to be able to do it. So is it so is it like automatic writing? Sort of, yeah, sort of. But I do have control over it. Okay. And uh, you've done three physical books and two e-books. 
Yes, yes. And if you stuck them all together into one book, how big would that book be? <laughs> 800 <laughs> pages? 1,000 <laughs> pages? Book. How many this, pages this, have you written this, so far? There's the three physical ones. <laughs> Let me, I'll show them again. Show them again one more time. Hang on. I'm just trying to line them up. That's the three physical ones. So show them one, uh, in the order in which you wrote them. One okay. Um, this this first one, Human by Day, Zeta by Night, was the first one I wrote because at that point I was absolutely terrified of coming out of the closet as an ET. So I wrote it as a fictional book, but it's based absolutely on fact. The second one, the Zeta message, is the story um, of when I was help, uh, helping out the family. It's sort of my autobiography, but it's also when I was helping out the family. Now, when I approached a publisher in America, uh, Granite Publishing, they accepted both books at the same time, and they were both put out at the same time. And how they marketed it was that this one is the non-fiction autobiography of myself and the family, and this one is a docudrama based on that. Um, and in Human by Day, Zeta by Night, uh, there's a massive amount of information in it. And I think I probably relaxed a bit more because it was going to be marketed as fiction. So there's a lot of information in that book on the on the ET. And but you, uh, Zeta message it is absolute pure fact. And show the third one. The third one, this, this one, um, extraterrestrial presence on Earth lessons in history. I was actually asked to write that. It was really funny because I just got the other two books published. And when you get a book published, it's like there's a huge load lifted off your shoulders. It's oh, thank God. And that would have been about 2011, I think they came out. Let's check um, when they were published. Can't find it. Oh, yeah, 2011. And at the end of 2011, November 2011, I found myself up on the ship with a whole bunch of people. And Sherry Wilde was also there. We've spoken about this together. And they were asking for volunteers to um, speak out about the hijacking of the planet, which occurred many, many millennia ago. Um, by a, a negative group down here. And I was trying to hide behind a couple of tall, Pleiadian type people because I didn't want to, you know, I've just finished the books. So I didn't want to be involved in anything else. And one of them pushed me forward, go on a look, you, you could write a book on it, couldn't you? You could go on an author, you could write a book. So I got pushed forward um, and volunteered to write a book on the history of planet Earth. And so this extraterrestrial presence on Earth is the one that came out of that. And speak about your two electronic books now. Uh, these ones is Cosmic Spirituality, Blending Religion and Science in Oneness. Um, and it's basically about, um, well, cosmic spirituality as opposed to religion down here um, and how science and spirituality should work together in oneness, which is really important. The other one, an interview with an alien, this is based on, I don't know if you've ever heard of Lawrence Spencer's book, Alien Interview. Have you ever heard of that? No. Um, he was supposedly sent notes by a woman who was a nurse working in at a military base in America at the time of the Roswell crash. And she um, got a chance to speak to a survivor of the Roswell crash. And I read this book many, many years ago. and got quite annoyed about it because, yes, there was a survivor of the Roswell crash um, who was trying to get information across, but what is in this book, a lot of it is disinformation. So I think that the notes that were sent were based on truth, but someone's got hold of them and twisted them. Um, but I was in the process of writing my other books at the time, so I thought I'll just put it aside. But when I finished all these other books, I thought, no, I'm going to rewrite that story and correct the mis misinformation that's been put through. Um, so that's what that book's about, an interview with an alien. 
So, um, how's the book? Uh, how is it? Um, what's the format? Your, um, your. Well, I, I, go ahead. I, I deal with it the same way um, that Lauren Spencer did, um, in that it's like a dialogue between this nurse and the ET who survived the crash. And I quote a lot from his book. I actually approached him and asked him if he wanted to co-write with me, and he, and he didn't. He didn't bother. didn't want to bother. Um, but I take sections out of the book where they've been misinterpreted, and I reinterpret them to what she, the ET was really trying to say. Okay, so um, you believe that somebody got a hold of Lawrence Spencer and got him to misinterpret. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. All right, well, it seems like we've gone over just about everything. Uh, yes. Is, is there, and we did well, it in less than two hours. <laughs> uh, is there any uh, interesting experiences you've had or knowledge you'd like to impart that we haven't gone over? Um, well, I think probably that the main thing that the ETs need people to understand is that I, we're a consciousness. We're not a physical body. We're a consciousness. This is one of the main things that they keep pushing. It's really, really important for us to understand that. Our body is just, it's just a vehicle. We are a consciousness that goes on for eternity, and that consciousness is the God that people talk about, and it permeates the whole universe. So that's extremely important to understand. Reincarnation is a fact. That's something else that's extremely important to understand because what the ETs want us to, to, to come to an understanding is of oneness. God is oneness. And so by understanding and accepting reincarnation, that we've had lives in many different forms, many different cultures, many different religions. And so by understanding that, it gives us an empathy towards others so that we approach others with a sense of love and oneness rather than a sense of fear. That's extremely important. So they're the two really main things that they want us to understand. There's something else, I'll just see if I've got it here somewhere. Um, no, I haven't got it on me. Uh, there was something that they told us once that they would like to encapsulate. Um, I'm just trying to think of what it was. I wish I'd written it down. Um, that we must understand the universe in terms of energy, um, understand the universe in terms of oneness. And by doing this, it helps us to understand unconditional love as opposed to fear. And the sooner humans of Earth can come to this understanding, the better off we'll be as a planetary culture. So um, the, the Zeta, what you're explaining to me is that the Zetas are not only not, on, not, only not going to take over this world, they don't come from this plane, they're from a higher plane. They come from a higher plane, yes. And they're only here to help, to help people to be healed. Um, what people are taken up on the ships for is to open up more of our DNA. DNA is multidimensional. They talk down here about junk DNA, but that's just because they can't, they don't have the instrumentation to measure it down here. The technology in Earth is very, very basic. Um, we need to have more of our DNA activated in order for us to be able to access more of our consciousness. Consciousness and DNA are intrinsically linked. And as we evolve up what they call the human ladder, we're only on level one here. So we can only access about 10% of our potential consciousness. Once we have more DNA activated up to about 20%, then we'll be able to activate, um, access 20% of our consciousness, et cetera, up the ladder until we get right up the top and we can access God consciousness. So if if a human um, were to have access to 100% of their capability uh, in their current form, they haven't evolved to a higher 
uh, level, but yet they have 100% of their capability. At their now they only have 10% at the moment. I know, I, I know, I know, I understand that. I'm just saying, theoretically speaking, if we were to have on this level where we're at now, if we had access to 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. If this is a theoretical question, yeah. Okay, let's say we had that capability. How close would we be to uh, the capability of a Zeta? Um, well, even the Zetas aren't quite there. Um, they've got access to about 50 to about 80 percent of their conscious awareness. So even though they're way beyond us, they're not. Yeah, they're still not. Full, quite they're not there. at full capability. No, not full capability. Once you get to full capability, you just move right past physical form. So you don't even need basically energy. You don't even need a physical form if you, you don't get, need a physical form. You've learned all your lessons. Okay. So how how much of a human if humans evolve from ten percent to say fifty percent? Yeah. They still need a physical form if they were fifty percent. Yeah, so they would still have physical form if they, if they wanted to. It would be a much simpler form, a bit like the rays. Um, but if they need a physical form, they can still use it. Some some do, some don't. Some some want a physical form, some don't. Um, generally, off, uh, many many of them up on the ships don't use a physical form. We just appear as a light body. But if so, we need a body, we can use it. So you've seen a lot of. Um beings that are in light body only. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look, my, my great teacher, Maris, once approached me and he was in the form of an orange orb. Did you not reckon? Uh, when, when I first saw the orb, no, I didn't. I felt this. It was really amazing because I felt this huge love come out of me and surround me. And my conscious human mind said, you know, what am I feeling this with an orange orb? And then the next thing, he shape-shifted so I could see who it was and put his arms around me and, and wrap me in his cape. Um, and I just burst into tears. It was so so profoundly joyous. <laughs> it wasn't tears of sadness. It was tears of joy. Um, but, yeah, he showed himself to me that he so, first approached me as an orb. So you, had, you basically were back amongst family at that mm. point. And um, so Morris, it, how, spell his name again? M-A-R-I-S. That's what I thought. So Morris is a one of your family that you've been around for longer than you have been in yeah. your human yeah. body. Yeah, soul family. Soul family. Yeah. Okay. And um, so you do... You do Reiki, you do uh, Tai Chi, you tai do Chi, Qigong. Qigong, yeah. What else do you do besides those three? Oh, that keeps me busy. <laughs> Is it? Okay, so. <laughs> oh, and writing. I do a bit of writing. I'm actually trying to work on a children's book at the moment, but it's taking me ages because I'm having to illustrate it myself and I'm not an artist, so <laughs> I'm having a bit of fun with that. Um, is there anything you want to say to... It sounds like some of the things you said, are, it, I feel like I've learned a lot of different things in this conversation that I didn't know. And uh, I hope the the listener feels the same way. They should. <laughs> uh, you would think, you know. And uh, I appreciate you for being on the show. And is there anything else you'd like to say to everybody besides love, 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 love? <laughs> Oh, if that's that's the bottom line. Unconditional love, you know, that's the whole the whole key. That's that's our link with oneness. To, to you know, move away from fear and into love. And as I say, when you when you remember reincarnating as different cultures and religions, um, and you realise that you've got an empathy with all these other beings, you know, if if everyone could do that, war would cease on this planet. Oh, speaking of war, I thought about it a minute ago and it went right out of my head. How do you feel about Mr. Putin's war? 
Oh, <laughs> we're not allowed to comment on political stuff down here. But what's really you're human. Important? You can come. You you're a human. No. You're not a. You right now. You're not an ET. <laughs> you're a human. Got, I'm still going to play by the rules upstairs. Um, but one thing that they really do want people to understand is that the negative force down here is operating through both political extremes, extreme right and extreme left. I think they call it the um, um, horseshoe theory down here, in that the two extremes come together and meet. And that's really important for people to understand that. And they're run by the controllers of this planet who, who use divide and conquer as their way of controlling humanity. And humanity has been brainwashed by them by, for millennia, right since the Old Testament times. Well, I was almost going to end this conversation and I realized <laughs> that you've just now opened up a whole new. <laughs> you've restarted it. So please tell the uh, human race about their controllers. Okay, it's all about it in my extraterrestrial presence on Earth book. It was a race of humans who were developed back in the time of the dinosaurs, and they're reptili reptilian-type humans, and they're still reincarnating down here. They're the ones who are like the controllers of the planet. Um, they take Earth human form now, so you can't tell who they are. Um, they're the ones that Stephen Greer talks about as running the, the black ops or the shadow government. They're, they're spoken about a lot at the moment. Um, and they're behind all extreme political views and all extreme religious views. Um, do you believe in the archives? Uh, well, that's sort of part of it. So you're saying the ones that control the planet work for the archives? Well, they are the archons, probably. I don't know a great deal. I have heard that term archons, but they probably are the archons. I've it's seen, like a it's like a, a a race behind humanity. I've seen a I've seen humans that were um I, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around what they are. I know they're they're they look human, but they're not. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. They're, they're that, reptilian human. Well, I'm not sure these are shape shifting reptilian humans, but. You know, I don't know. I can't really pin them down. I just know that I've run into um, in my uh, some of my more negative experiences. I've run into um, people that looked human, but I knew were something more, and yeah. I didn't know what they were. Yeah, they they can actually shape shift, so they can take on any form. I mean, they can even appear as an angel if they want to like, to fool people. Um, yeah. So that's the archons. Okay, I call so, them the Reptarians because they were actually developed down here on Earth. They're a reptilian race, but they were developed here on Earth. The off-planet reptilians are mainly fine. It's this Reptarian group you've got to watch. Okay, okay. So um, do you understand the that um, – have you ever – dissected the the hierarchy of of the reptarians versus the archons because see to me an archon is not a a, a reptilian that can shape shift it's a uh I'll maybe you know i can't i can't say what an archon is because i'm not an expert on archons but i i just don't think of shape shifting reptilians as being archons now that doesn't mean they aren't it just means my mind doesn't merge the two together. So yeah, yeah. we are dissected that that dark side of how the controllers, you know, who is who and who the lower and upper and all that. Have you ever? Gotten yeah, that? no, no, not really, because you know, um, you know, it's all energy, and I think you know, it's, it's low frequency energy as opposed to high frequency energy. You know, down here we've got to put labels on everything. Well, there's the archons, and there's the reptarians, and this is that, and that's this. Um, but I, I try and look beyond labels. It's just low frequency energy as opposed to high frequency energy. All right. Well, I, I actually think we've. Uh, completed your interview i just um is there any you know when when we start getting into the controllers of the planet that's an area that i'm sure there are quite a few humans that want to know 
more details on that oh, side. Well, you know, here we go. <laughs> and I'll talk about the edge. They, they should read your book, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of info in there. And that's the book I was specifically asked to write by upstairs. And I think they might have approached my publisher at the same time because when I was thinking of it and sort of tossing it over in my mind, my publisher came out and said, oh, why don't you write a book about the history of Earth? So I think they've spoken to him too. And that was published in about 2018, I think. Uh, yes, 2018. I think that book might be available as an e-book. I'm not exactly sure. Or Kindle. Okay, well, I do appreciate you being on the show. You're, you've been, uh, if you had more, if you could re uh, dissect the dark side, that would be even better. <laughs> uh, but it's all negative energy, and it's just different yeah. levels of the same negative force. Yes, and, and that's why it's important not to focus too much on the negative. Be aware of it, but don't link into it too much, because you just give it strength. Well, I like to think of the creator as being uh, uh, beyond the creation and the creation being a dualistic construct. You have the dark side and the light side are both part of the creator. It's all within. That's the right. creator. So even the darkness is not outside the creator, even though it likes to think it is. That's it's right. All, it's all the creator. It's all the creation. It's all energy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Everything is energy, and you know. Anyway, uh, thank you for being my guest. Uh, oh, thanks very much for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. It's been lovely talking to you. Uh, the same from my side. It's been my pleasure also. And uh, tell any uh, any enlightened souls like yourself uh, who to call to be on his show. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, okay, so let me go ahead and stop the recording here. Here we go. Uh,